Let me first speak about the role of advocates. For several centuries, the legal profession has been regarded as a noble and honorable profession around the world. That is now under danger and attack as we are increasingly becoming a business-oriented profession. And that is not merely because our clients are drawn from business, but because of the nature of our organization, which is now veering around to a more business-oriented profession. The profession of law yet is on a different pedestal from various other professions because it concerns itself with the administration of justice, which is a cornerstone of a civilized society. The exalted position of the legal profession is due to the canons of professionalism and the code of conduct associated with its practice. Lawyers who do not observe the highest standards of professional ethics are neither respected by their peers in the profession nor by the community at large. So in that sense, our accountability towards our maintaining the ethics of the profession is enforced both by the respect which we command with our peers as well as by the respect which we command in the wider community. Although entry to the legal profession can be secured by completing the requirement of technical competence for qualification as a lawyer, the honor as a professional is only earned through conduct in professional life. When lawyers behave in ways which are not in accordance with the highest standards of professional ethics, and do not faithfully shoulder the responsibilities that are expected from legal professions, people begin to lose confidence in the profession and eventually in the administration of justice. So ethics in that sense is crucial to the confidence which people hold in our profession and therefore necessarily in, a, a necessary ingredient of the vibrance of our own uh, existence. I therefore urge all of you to keep this in mind, since the future of the legal profession is dependent on the standards of integrity and professionalism maintained by all of us, that is by people for whom this profession is their bread and butter. It is only through adherence to the highest standards of professional ethics that the reputation of the legal profession can be enhanced. <coughs> we must remember that our privileges as lawyers and the corresponding duties that come along with these privileges are what define our personality. The privilege of calling yourself as a lawyer comes with many perquisites. You are treated with respect and deference, not only by your clients, but also by the public generally. You are recognized as an officer of the court when you appear in a courtroom. But it is important to remember that reputation and honor, which can take many years to build, can be lost in a vanishing moment should you fail to live up to the high professional standards imposed upon you by virtue of your entry into the profession. Just last week, we had a dispute between a husband and a wife. The wife was unrepresented and she was appearing in person. The respondent, who was the husband, was represented by a woman member of the bar who was an advocate on record. And we told her that, look, for a moment, please stand apart from your commitment to your client. And now you act as an officer of the court and try and resolve the dispute. She said, all right, I'll try my best. After two days, she came back and reported to us that both the parties are speaking to me. Exactly one week later, there was a settlement in the case. So that really, to my mind, that, that short little hearing on three or four different dates, which led to a settlement, reflected to me the highest commitment in that sense of an advocate on record, not merely to her own client, but to the fact that she was then acting as an officer of the court. And she was able to discharge a multiplicity of roles which the court had imposed upon her, namely of being an advocate for the client, at the same time being fair to the court, of being fair to an opponent against whom she had been engaged, and above all, being a fair exponent of the community's sense of justice in the advocate on record system. The English judge, Edward Abbott Parry, in his book called The Seven Lamps of Advocacy, 
a book which is widely referred to by academicians and lawyers as a source principle of legal ethics discuss the seven virtues that every lawyer should possess particularly in the context of the topic which we are covering today he called it the seven lamps of advocacy they are honesty courage industry wit judgment eloquence and fellowship these were the seven lamps of advocacy as they call as he called them namely honesty courage industry wit judgment eloquence and fellowship let me give you a very small anecdote of one of my younger years at the bar when i was a young lawyer in uh, in mumbai i was a, i was briefed by a sugar a sugar mill to argue a tax case and i was instructed on the in the high court by wait by a doyen of the bar mr d m popert who was one of the counsel who led the preparations in the keshwanand bharti in fact golaknath and then keshwanand bharti case we argued in bits and pieces as you know judges tend to hear cases in bits and pieces uh, a little joke on that a little later on bits and pieces if i don't forget so we argued in bits and pieces about 7 or 8 days and then finally the bench had broken up and the case was listed on the last day before the vacation just as i had a final hearing listed today just before we broke for the vacation and the judges were dead against me i knew that they were going to throw out the matter so the judges looked at me one of them was in fact a very distinguished member of our bar just as vm mota who passed away recently and uh, just as mota looked at me and said you know he says why don't you take your chance somewhere else uh you today is now the last day of the vacation and uh, we were in chambers so he said why don't you go and take your chance somewhere else after the reopening so i looked at them and i said that uh, i said i know that your lordships are against me i believe i have done to the best of my ability i have explained whatever i had to explain to you uh the ball is now in your court it's now for your lordships to decide and i am quite i am personally satisfied that there is nothing else that has to be argued in the matter so the instructing advocate pulled at my gown and said in gujarati he says what on earth are you saying take the opportunity and run if you are going to another court so i said sorry i mean uh, i think i'm uh, i'm very satisfied with the quality of uh, the hearing i've got and i'll close my uh, papers and you lot just may now deliver the judgment so they looked at each other and uh, the judges uh, said uh, well that is very fair of you but to be very honest we are very tired now of writing another judgment in the vacation so anyway we are now going to treat it as a deep art heard and you can uh, the, let the matter run its course so the matter was made deep art heard we went before a new bench and we succeeded and my client got a full refund so that also reminds you that every litigation has a every case has a kundali ultimately but <laughs> my most important what i wanted to tell you about this incident was that uh though i would have possibly lost the client and perhaps the solicitor who was instructing me i gained in my stature before the learned judges who were instructing me and not merely did i not lose that client or the solicitor but they continued to brief me almost all through until i became a judge of the bombay high court so in that sense your sense of commitment to the cause of justice and this is something which we tend to forget a lot in terms of our own ethics that your term your sense of commitment to the cause of justice is much higher than in that sense your commitment to your client for the simple reason that your satisfaction as a lawyer is because you are competing with yourself very often as lawyers we believe we are competing with an opponent but i have always felt and similarly as a judge as well as a judge you don't compete with anybody at all because you don't have to you're not paid to get an outcome as a lawyer you are paid to get an outcome but your competitor is not your opponent your competitor is your own conscience and your own ability and i think that is something which we need to uh, bear in mind uh before i go on to the next part of my lecture i'll tell you something about this bits and pieces advocacy we are the very distinguished chief justice in the bombay high court and uh, he, what he would normally do is that he would normally open up a one case hear it for about 
45 minutes then hear another case hear it for about 45 minutes here so he would have about 20 to 25 parthards going on at any given point of time i found it very disconcerting when i sat with the learned judge for the simple reason that i feel that if you have one parthard finish it complete the judgment and be done with it you know you're rid of your responsibility but this judge had this ability to uh, keep 20 or 25 parthards the pot boiling for different lawyers of course the lawyers were very happy because they got 25 different sets of fees uh, in, in different matters over, say, three or four months. Until one day, Mr. Surabji came to the Bombay High Court to argue the case, to argue a case. And in the evening, there was this uh, event at the bar, like you are having today. So we met Mr. Surabji over a cup of tea. So in his very imit inimitable style, he tells me that, you know, this judge you are sitting with reminds me of a motor mechanic. So I said, why is that, sir? So he says, it reminds me of a motor mechanic because you know what a motor, motor mechanic does, he will open the bonnet of a car, he will remove the fan belt of one car, the carburetor of another car, the radiator of another car, the axle, the, the wheels will be removed of another car. So none of the 20, 25 uh, customers can get the car out of the workshop. <laughs> Having done that, he will then start reassembling the car one by one. He says that's what is happening in. Uh, so that's about the bits and pieces. All right, back to our uh, back to our uh, discussion. Now the role and duties of advocates has been beautifully elucidated by Justice Denning in that classical judgment called Rondell versus Worsley in 1967, 1 QB 443 in the Court of Appeal, and I just want to read out to you. Uh, a little extract from uh, the role and duty of an advocate. Lord Denning said, as an advocate, the barrister in a, is a minister of justice, equally with the judge. He has a monopoly of audience in the higher courts. See how true it is about what you do as advocates on record. No one can save, no one save he can address the judge unless it be a litigant in person. This carries with it a corresponding responsibility. He cannot pick or choose his clients. He is bound to accept a brief for any person who comes before the courts. No matter how great a rascal the person may be, no matter how given to complaining, no matter how undeserving or unpopular his cause, he must defend him to the end provided only that he is paid a proper fee or in the case of a doc brief, a nominal fee. He must accept the brief and do all he honorably can on behalf of his client. I say all he honorably can because it is his duty, not only to his client. He has a duty to the court which is paramount. It is a mistake to suppose that he is the mouthpiece of his client, to say what he wants, or his tool to do what he directs. He is none of these things. He owes allegiance to a higher cause. It is the cause of truth and justice. He must not consciously misstate the facts. He must not knowingly conceal the truth. He must not unjustly make a charge of fraud that is without evidence to support it. He must produce all the relevant authorities, even those that are against him. He must see that his client discloses, if ordered, the relevant documents, even those that are fatal to his case. He must disregard the most specific instructions of his clients if they conflict with his duty to the court. Undoubtedly, lawyers sometimes find themselves in difficult situations while deciding which duty will take precedence in guiding specific causes of action. This is called the lawyer's trilemma, not the lawyer's dilemma, but the lawyer's trilemma, which is more difficult than a dilemma. The lawyer's trilemma is a common phrase because lawyers have multiplicities of duties which may be in conflict with each other. This term trilemma was introduced in Professor Munro Friedman's famous article on the trilemma which lawyers face when dealing with possible perjury. Attorneys are supposed to keep their clients' confidences secret, to advocate zealously, and to disclose perjury. You can't do all the three at the same time. Something has to give. 
His original article published in 1975 started a debate that continues to rage even until today. Criminal defense lawyers, for example, might believe that they have, in particular matters, far greater obligations to protect the interests of their clients and far fewer obligations to protect the rule of law or the public interest. However, I believe that there is a way to resolve this dilemma or trilemma, if you may call it. Lawyers should consider whether their actions are within a fair interpretation of the bounds of law. In any case, lawyers also have an obligation to participate in efforts to reform the legal framework or society more generally, that is to better serve the goal of protecting the rights of criminal defendants and the public interest in the fair and efficient administration of justice. Just yesterday we had a case where a 302 conviction where a person in Tripura didn't get a lawyer. It ended in a conviction and there had to be a remand because nobody was willing to appear for that. Is that really, in that sense, a fair dispensation of justice by the legal profession? Thus, while you may choose to defend or appear on behalf of any client and even have a duty to represent any client in need of legal representation, you must not detract from the bounds of law. And that's where I believe that the law, in a sense, is ideologically neutral. Lawyers may have ideological affiliations, but the law by its nature, the legal profession has to be ideologically neutral by virtue of our duty to represent any client who comes before us, irrespective of the popularity or the unpopularity of the cause. You must not mislead the court while you discharge your obligations towards your client. Furthermore, while you represent your client in court, you must bear in mind that you are also representing certain interests that have an impact on the society at large. And this is particularly significant today because more and more of our law is being involved in public law as opposed to purely private disputes. So the impact of a position which a lawyer takes has a serious bearing on the rights of the community at large, on the impact of, of, of the legal action on the community of la at large. Never be oblivious to this realization. As long as you remember that you are in a position to have a long-lasting and palpable impact on the social fabric and more often than not may end up shaping and molding the climate of your time, you will be less inclined to stray from the path of justice. The second aspect which I want to emphasize is preparation and perseverance. While academic knowledge is definitely an asset, there is no substitute for hard work in this profession. Moreover, it is your duty to be well prepared so that you may be able to do justice to your client and the place and time you occupy before the court. As the saying goes, perseverance is the right hand of success and patience is her left hand. These values are not developed overnight. While we often admire the advocacy skills and eloquence of lawyers that we see in court, there are years of diligence, patience, steady application, painstakingly studious habits, prolonged preparation, and laborious apprenticeship behind what appears. The strenuous and hard toil that the busy lawyer must undergo in studying the record, preparing cases, and looking up references are seldom remembered when others envy her success and good fortune. Lawyers at the beginning of their career should build the skills from scratch by hard work and persistent labor. The process of rigorous learning that you are now undergoing as a part of the preparation for the AOR exam must continue for the rest of your professional lives. In that sense, we are students every day of, your, of our lives. For me, I was appearing in 65 different examinations on the last day of the term. A commitment to improving your knowledge of diverse subjects, your drafting and oral advocacy skills must permeate your tryst with the legal profession. Spend time in courts listening to good argumentation and observing the subtler and finer points of advocacy. Watching judges discern the crucial points of fact and law and apply legal principles is also a learning process. There is much to learn from respected seniors 
and even talented juniors in this profession keep yourself updated about new laws rules and current affairs and be aware of the economic political social and intellectual environment law above all is a dynamic profession even after 19 years as a judge i am always learning this examination is part of this lifelong learning process it tests your knowledge of course but it also tests your inclination and dedication towards the profession it is in the nature of a filter one that ensures that clients are represented before the court by persons who by virtue of their qualification are deemed to have an excellent standard of training in the law the hard work that you put in while preparing for these exams will in a lot of ways set the tone for the rest of your professional life 